good afternoon everybody so uh, welcome to uh, this uh, very important and uh, interesting um, lecture we are going to get today um, by uh, dr priyanta herat um, who is a, a graduate from peradeniya and um, i had the pleasure in invite uh, introducing him on behalf of the faculty and the pems of both because our dean professor uh, sandeep pinto is in colombo today and unable to uh, be here physically so um, um to tell a little bit about uh, priyanta you know he is he comes from the same school i come from kandy uh, darwaja college kandy he um, graduated from uh, peradeniya uh, and he entered as a batch 86 87 and uh, subsequently uh, he obtained his uh, phd in uh, neuroscience at karolinska institute uh, sweden and then went on to ob- obtain his uh, us board certification in neurology then uh, having completed two fellowships in movement disorders and deep brain simulation and stereotaxy he worked uh, as an academic neurologist for the last 12 years and in the last uh, several years uh, he has been leading clinical development and of gene therapies for neurodegenerative diseases at biotech enterprises so going back you know to the net i saw he was he has been working with so many biotech companies including white voyage therapeutics and uh, and uh, i think he has traveled a lot and worked at so many places i have seen him working at kansas city columbia and currently he serves as a executive uh, director of uh, clinical development at capsida biotherapeutics leading their uh, cns gene therapy development so he is a proud alumnus of uh, peradeniya um, medical school and um, i have a great privilege in uh, you know getting him here and um, i'm sure we are all going going to hear um, something very exciting which uh, most of us are not familiar with i am certainly i am not very familiar with this um, high tech uh, gadgets and all so i'll try to learn at least something so i'm sure there are so many of them uh, listening um, uh, online and uh, okay over to you grantha uh, for the uh, for your lecture yeah, Shara, thanks uh, for the introduction. Um, for those of you who are here in person and also on the Zoom, um, I want to say thank you for taking the time. Um, as Tushar said, I was here, I started here. It's been a long journey, but this is where everything started. So uh, it's really a privilege to come back and, uh, and share things that I have learned over the years, hoping that I can inspire some of you and, and also part of some of my knowledge to some of you. Um, sorry about the little echo that's coming. I don't know what it is. Let's see. Oh, that's better. Okay, got it. I managed to fix it. So yeah, so uh, the title of the talk is an introduction to gene therapy. And what we are trying to do is to give you a broad introduction to molecular biology applications. I'm not going to teach you molecular biology as such because that's not going to happen in one single lecture. um uh, and how do you use these application to human disease modification what i want to try to do is to give you a very brief so the way that i'm going to do this is to give you a very brief introduction uh, as to what genes are and talk very briefly about what genetic diseases mean and how do you approach them once you understand what genetic diseases and how do you develop treatments uh, gene therapies but not only do you develop therapies uh, for example in the lab you have to get these to the people the humans uh, through various uh, animal models to begin with so how do you deliver these therapies to the patients and then of course i want to discuss a little bit about the challenges how do you get this stuff from bench to the bedside but i think the more important question i want to probably discuss is what the future might look like and you might wonder this stuff that he's going to talk about is probably not relevant or even if it is relevant we probably can't do this stuff here so i want to tell you what you can do uh for you to think about uh think about it like i started here so i started doing this stuff so i think the biggest message that i have for you is if i could do it you should be able to do it um if nothing else if i can leave you with that uh i would be happy so with that i'm going to move on so genes everybody who had done a little bit of biochemistry will remember what genes are but fundamentally genes are the nature's way of transmitting necessary information to make proteins from one generation to the next i say proteins because proteins are the ultimate effect of all biological functions so the what what genes do is to carry that information from 
generation number one to generation number two and generation number two to generation number three. This is all done by using a universal code. As far as we know life, this is it for us. And uh, so the four bases that are used are um, A to T, G to C, that's the coupling that occurs. And so if you think about genes as a string of beads, um, A binds to T on uh, uh, a complementary strand or a string of beads, and uh, C binds to G um, or, 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 or inverse of that. And then these two strands kind of twist in a left-handed turn, which becomes the DNA double helix. Uh, and that's how genetic information is packaged and kept in, in, in each cell, and then eventually undergoes different processes to, uh, to pass this stuff to the next generation. But before the next generation, it's also important to remember that function of this information that's carried in the cells is to make stuff. Fundamentally, the stuff that genes are directing to make are proteins. And how that information is carried is depicted on the, uh, the little carton on the right side. So if you look at the reference sequence, which would be considered as your normal sequence of genes, you could imagine uh, a set of genes that carry a, a message for A, message for B, message for C, and message for D. So each one of these messages uh, are composed by three letters, as you remember what are called codons. And uh, each codon generally uh, refers to an individual amino acid. So now uh, the more important part for this particular program um, is to understand that the reference free uh, uh, sequence can alter or undergo changes by different ways. You can duplicate some letters, you can delete a certain letter, you can invert a certain letter, or you can translocate or shift uh, those letters. So these are the different ways of uh, mutations occurring. And so mutations are defined as any heritable change to the DNA sequence. So with that introduction, oh, slides, come on. I just want to show you, uh, give you a snapshot of what DNA, what different biological processes that DNA undergoes. So the first uh, part of the, the uh, panel shows how DNA is replicated. Uh, this is what is called DNA transcription. Uh, this is where DNA is kind of duplicated so that Two copies are made, two almost identical copies are made, and these are passed on to the next generation through your uh, either your uh, ovum or the sperm, in the case of humans. Uh, but within a given organism, including us, as long as we are alive, we are basically fighting physics of uh, the chaos of physics. And so this is a way of sort of withholding uh, decay. And what in order to accomplish that, DNA must be read. Whatever the information that's in those beaded strings of letters must be read. That happens by a process called transcription. So the original information is being read off of the original DNA because if you were to directly use the DNA itself to make proteins every time, the odds of generating um, errors is much, much higher. So the nature has really done a really remarkable job by evolution where DNA is read and that produces something called uh, different, well, different kinds of RNA. But for the purpose of this talk, let's stick with what is called messenger RNA. And that process is called transcription. Once DNA information is transcribed into an mRNA, that undergoes some maturation. Uh, some pieces are being cut off, what is called splicing. And then some, some pieces of the RNA strand gets matured by adding a tail of um, adenylate moieties to the end, so what is called polyadenylation, et cetera, et cetera. All these different things undergo, uh, 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 sort of happen to the RNA before RNA is ready to go through the ribosomal complex, which is where the message that is contained in the mRNA is read off in the ribosomal machinery and different uh, amino acids are attached to one after the other, kind of like, a brick factory, one brick or a piece of bread and another bread and another bread, and eventually a protein is formed. So that's the, that's pretty much everything. This is the, all the, me, the metabolic processes that happen to the, the information that's contained in the DNA. Ultimately, a protein is formed. So that's pretty much, I basically covered all of your genetics in like two slides. Uh, Hopefully you sort of remember most of these things, but I think the purpose is really not to teach you stuff, really to give you guide. 
guidance as to where to go look up things once you remember oh that's how it happens any one of you who are curious can now go and, and flip the pages of your leninger or whatever the textbooks that you guys use i actually still read leninger by the way uh i still have the latest copy so um so yeah you can go back and read this stuff uh if you're interested. So now with that background in my mind, I want to talk about the human genome. All of you have read about the human genome. Human genome is the entirety of all of the information that's contained in each one of our cells that make us who we are. So the entire human genome is actually 3 billion base pairs. And that sounds like a lot. 3 billion is a lot of letters. Now the key is to remember is that fantastic as we are and cool as we are, your basic Bombay onion actually has about 150 uh, uh, billion base pairs. So the number of the base pairs is not a function of how complex you are. It may be that the onions are more complex than humans, but it's something to remember. Big as these, these uh, genomes are, some of them are small, some of them are big. What is important to remember is that out of the 3 billion base pairs, we only have about 20,000 genes. So that means 20,000 sets of genes that produce proteins. Now, around 1999 to 2000, there was a big ha-ho about the entire human genome being sequenced. And that was a huge accomplishment, but I kind of want to add a little bit to that story because when they published the entire human genome at that time, about 20% of the genome was unread. So just about a couple of months ago, people have completed what is called the telomere to telomere, that is the end, one end to the other end of a chromosome, the entire thing of all of the 22 chromosomes plus your sex chromosome has now been read. So the entire T to T sequence data are now available. So I would recommend that, oh, suggest any one of you, if one person in this audience does this, it will still be good enough. I had the privilege of talking to the woman who led that work. Her name's Karen Miga. Uh, she's actually in Portland. Uh, so anyway, I, I spoke to her because I was so fascinated by the fact that we finally have the entire blueprint of how to make a human. Uh, not that we know how to do it because complexity is obviously beyond our comprehension. But the point is, 20 of the 20,000 genes, we are now able to make, at least we have the blueprint. The next iterations will come in the next few generations. Um, I don't think I want to go through the details of this, the, the slide, uh, the part on the right hand side. It's basically showing you the lengths of different uh, 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 base pairs in each chromosome and how many functioning genes or protein coding genes and, and non-protein uh, coding regions are there. Obviously, we have more non-protein coding genes than protein coding genes. And the key is not to think of the non-protein coding genes as junk. That's kind of used to be the, the concept, but we now think that they have multiple and important biological functions, which is why they are there. So. Here's another cartoon. So with that complexity of the human genome, uh, we now estimate that there are about 7,000 human diseases that have direct genetic basis. Here, I'm not even talking about diseases like heart disease or hypertension and such, but direct uh, diseases such as, for example, any one of you who has seen a kid with some uh, disease of, uh, uh, I don't know, metabolism might have seen this case, or any one of you has seen a patient with Huntington disease, Huntington gene is located on chromosome 4. That gene is abnormally Huntington disease. In chromosome 17, I believe, is the gene for cystic fibrosis. Prime, uh, oh, actually, sorry, it's, it's uh, the, the uh, neurofibromatosis. Uh, it's, it is. So, so anyway, so this is not the entire list. Obviously, I can't list 7,000 genes. But the key is, out of the documented 9,000 or so human diseases, about 7,000 probably have genetic basis. So anytime you see a patient that might be rare, you have to remember, oh, there are, this is where this stuff is coming from. Um, so we'll try to go through some of these details uh, through my talk. So once you know that, um, I really want to then jump to what is hap what happened in the past and what is shaping our future. So, so the genetic code was described uh, in 1953 by Watson and Crick and also Franklin Rosalind uh, the woman, she never got the credit. So for the young women who are here and not, not so young women also, I want to emphasize the fact that science is done both by men and women. And so you have a role to play. Don't let anyone oppress you when somebody tells you, you don't understand this or mansplain, tell them off. Uh, young women, mark my words, 
important. So, so the key is that I'm trying to say is that, so this work has been going on for at least 60 years or so now. So people already had the inkling that some diseases are transmitted genetically. They go from one generation to another. For example, Huntington ex, uh, described the Huntington uh, disease in 1904. So we knew this even before DNA was described. So people started fiddling with the genes in the early 60s and very quickly that that work kept moving and kept progressing. And by 2016, we already have a couple of drugs that are approved uh, for certain diseases that are genetically uh, uh, caused by genetic gene abnormalities. So 2016 is barely five years ago. Uh, that was the year that my father died. I actually came here after he died here. But then very soon by 2017, another transformational technology has taken place. I will talk about uh, what is AAV gene therapy. And if you think 2019, when Zolgensma for uh, spinal muscular atrophy was approved, that was barely two years ago. And I was working on similar technology by then. And, and this is how fast this future is moving. Already people like myself and my colleagues and others, we are already into actually editing the genome itself. So, so the past is shaping our future and future is moving so fast that it's already happening. As we speak, somebody is figuring things out. So the ultimate goal is of course, individually and precisely treat uh, pretty much all of the human diseases, including the common diseases like hypertension, heart disease, kidney disease and whatnot. So the timelines are shifting. This is when, this is a fantastic time in your lives for those of you who are in medicine you're looking at future happening. So this is the other reason I was really keen to come and talk to you about this stuff. This is your time, this is your generation. Next generation will see things that we never imagined happening in our lifetimes. And we will have treatments for things that you can't treat these days. So, so then I just wanna spend a little bit of time talking about mutations. Uh, we talked about how, what mutations are. So you can have two broad classes of mutations. Some mutations lead to an abnormal protein that has a toxic gain of function. Examples are things like uh, Huntington disease, uh, um, different types of spinal cerebellar ataxia, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, uh, Duchenne mus muscular dystrophy, a uh, bunch of others. Uh, last one is a 12 letter expansion, Unverich Lundborg disease. Uh, some of the people who are interested in neurology or pediatrics might have seen this, these are pediatric epilepsy syndromes. The other version or the other, so that's one umbrella. The other umbrella is what is called a toxic or rather a loss of function mutations where a certain protein goes missing and that leads to a, a disease. For example, SARS, different types of thalassemias, the major and the minor, sickle cell disease, uh, Lucian muscular dystrophy, pediatric ataxia. And for pediatricians who are in the crowd, uh, those of you who are interested in pe uh, pediatrics, many of the lysosomal storage diseases and inherited metabolic diseases generally fall into this, this class. Uh, I don't think I want to spend time. The, the key message here is not just the fact that this is where the gene is located, uh, the, uh, the, the beta globin gene, but that's not the point. The point is there are many ways of inducing uh, mutations in a given gene. So you can have a frame shift, you can have a deletion, you can have a translocation, et cetera. So all of this can lead to a dysfunctional gene. And that leads to the loss of function. That loss of function leads to the disease. Uh, this is generally also like an example of how we were taught biochemistry. Remember, uh, one gene, one protein, one function. In the case of many diseases, this is true. An example is beta thalassemia or, or sickle cell disease, an abnormal gene leads to one particular phenotype of a disease. On the other hand, we now understand that many diseases have multiple functions. Example would be the protein called Huntington protein, which is, uh, which is coded for by the Huntington gene that I mentioned to you. So it's an essential protein. We all have it in all of our cells, any abnormality to that, pro, uh, that protein. If happens early on in life. For example, if I were to take out the Huntington gene early on, it's embryo lethal, the, the embryo dies uh, before it becomes viable. Actually, by the time it begins to form the, the nervous system, it cannot progress, so it dies. The point is all of us have up to 36 of uh, these three letters at the CAG, 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 keeps repeating up to 36 times in, within that gene. So think of a meditation, um, uh, how do you call like a necklace or something which should have only 108 beads. 
Here's an instance where you have 113 or 115 or 165 beads. So obviously your routine normal practice of 100 day times repeating whatever cannot happen. You have an abnormal bead set. Just like that, the protein itself has, because the gene has more than 36, your protein also has uh, more than 36 uh, uh, glutamine, uh, because CAG codes for glutamine. So that makes the protein abnormal. That abnormal protein affects multiple functions. This is where the concept of one gene, one protein, one function breaks down. And that becomes important because you have to remember, we, all of our complexity is made with 20,000 genes. And this is how the nature achieves it by ascribing multiple functions to the same protein in different tissues at different times. So why, why did I mention this? This has implications to developing therapies. Now, if you want to develop a certain treatment that is precisely able to treat these diseases, you have to understand the exact molecular pathology that you're trying to aim for. So this is why I'm trying to give you two different examples to illustrate the complexity of this stuff. So, so if you are an aspiring person or an ambitious person, you pick a disease, any disease that interests you and you say, how do I fix this error or these errors? You pick a disease, you try to understand as best as possible the mutation and the end result, whether it's a loss of function or a toxic gain function, and you try to design treatments. And so the next few slides uh, is a description of how to go about this. This is where the concept of gene therapy comes in. Gene therapy is a strategy to provide therapeutic benefit, benefits by modifying a gene, either via disruption or correction or replacement. Now, since we went through what genes are and how they uh, function within a cell, you have two levels where you can do this work. One is to actually touch the DNA itself and make corrections. Or if you don't really want to touch the genome, which has huge implications, we'll talk about that. Then you can actually work on the RNA level. So in the case of toxic uh, gain of function diseases, you basically try to eliminate or stop the formation of whatever that toxic protein or the toxic mRNA from forming. Um, examples are treatment development, things like Huntington and a bunch of other diseases. Loss of mutation functions, you basically have to replace what is missing. Uh, all of this sounds pretty easy. In some ways they are, but obviously a lot of complexity is sexy. But the, the fundamental complex is you, you try to modify the gene such that you either replace or you sort of somehow modify the gene itself or it's, it's next level product. So let's see what happens. So I am going to now talk to you about different levels where this can be achieved. So the first level, obviously, is to correct the genome itself. The genome, when I say genome, I'm actually talking about the DNA. So genome editing technologies that are currently available, there are several different uh, technologies. And uh, all of these generally rely on naturally occurring DNA repair systems. Again, I want to emphasize that this work actually got started in the 60s. So about 50 years worth of work has been going into this. So those of you who remember your basic biochemistry, uh, and I do say that this should be basic. Everyone of you who practice medicine should probably remember some of this stuff because these do have implications because you're looking at the future now, right? So, so the original uh, DNA, uh, DNA editing technologies use something called protein guided nucleases. That's the work that we were doing in 2017, 18. Some of this work is still being done. But now, most of us are working with what are called RNA-guided nucleases. This is what won the Nobel Prize in 2018, the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Each one of these technologies basically try to precisely cut the double-stranded DNAs in a certain place where the abnormality is, and then paste, remove or correct whatever that abnormality might be, and then paste it together precisely, which leads to a corrected DNA sequence. And that theoretically should take care of the problem that uh, the abnormal gene was uh, causing. So very quick and a very brief single slide introduction to CRISPR-Cas9. This technology is very simple in some ways, obviously it won a Nobel Prize, so it is also com complex, but not complicated. Right, it's so based on uh, naturally occurring DNA repair systems that are that that actually occur in, in in bacteria. 
a CRISPR Cas9 system has two components. I'm not going to tell you the 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 the, ac the acronym. Uh, the CRISPR is a long long name. Just look it up. Um, you wouldn't remember anyways. Uh, so it's a two component system for targeted gene editing. If I know the abnormality in a given gene, I can target this. How do I do this? I artificially synthesize or engineer what is called a guide RNA strand or a single uh, uh, guide strand RNA. And then there is also a protein called CAS, a CRISPR associated endonuclease. That is the CAS protein. There are many of them. We currently mostly rely on something called the Cas9 system from the Staphylococcus bacteria. So all of the common cell uh, Staphylococci that you have on, on your skin, we can harvest the Cas9 protein, for example. So you combine the two and you deploy them. And so what happens is um, the Cas9 protein, well, the guide strand goes and reads the DNA uh, and attaches to the abnormal part because I have, remember the DNA itself has a, uh, sense strand and a, um, a uh, anti-sense strand, they are complementary, right? A binds to T, T binds to uh, A, G binds to C, C binds to G. So that complementarity is what I'm using when I'm engineering this stuff. And then so with that engineering, I can get this strand to go and read whatever that is abnormal. And that binding activates the Cas9 protein, which is capable, capable of inducing a double-stranded break. And then I have the option of actually attaching something to the guide strand that can fill in the gap if necessary, or just cut if it is just an expansion of a gene. And then every cell, every nucleus has multiple DNA repair enzymes that are naturally occurring. They just do the pasting. So in that way, this is very simple, which is also the beauty of the science. The CRISPR-Cas9 that won the Nobel Prize is fantastically simple. Uh, so yes, that's a single slide um, explanation to uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Obviously, I don't expect any one of you to uh, remember this, but I expect you to marvel at the simplicity of this and the beauty of this, and you go, oh my God, this is fantastic. This is what drives me to the work that I do now. In fact, I, I gave up what could have been a very lucrative uh, clinical career just to be in research because the beauty of this is something that uh, that just baffles me. I, I tell people, I, I, my work is, I marvel at my work and people say that's, that's incredible because it is really, I mean, you think like, you know, sending a rocket to Mars is fantastic and we say, no, that's not a big deal because we understand the physics, right? It's very, very complex physics, but it's very linear. This stuff is not. So anyway, so that's like, you know, the message here, complex system, but very simple. I think I'm gonna skip this. Any one of you who are actually interested in CRISPR-Cas9, I can explain the entire pathways uh, through two or three different slides. The, so the main idea is you have a very precise way of identifying an abnormal uh, part of a DNA that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a mutation. And then you, you can induce a double-stranded break, and then you can precisely remove or correct the part that was abnormal, and then you can have uh, the two ends of the two strands within the DNA pasting with each other. So you open a double strand of DNA, correct the thing and fix it. For example, your meditation thing, you basically go in and exactly remove whatever the pink colored beads that you didn't want to have there, remove that stuff, tie the thing and you're back to business. So that's CRISPR-Cas9 and that's the future. Now, if you think this is future, people have already started going beyond this uh, again, I, I don't think I'm going to talk, but, but I'll, I'll drop some words. So CRISPR-Cas9 is already new. People are now thinking about uh, making even more sophisticated versions with something called base editing, something called prime editing. These technologies are already happening in some of the labs in our labs. Uh, people are crazy smart. And the key is most of these people who are doing the work come from places like this. Actually, not from Sri Lanka, not many, but a bunch of people are from India, some people from, from uh, Nepal a bunch of Chinese folks, people who, had, who grew up with nothing, who did not have opportunities, who did not have computers, uh, but still went to schools like this. So that, remember that this is, I started here. This is the work that I'm doing now. So that's the message really not to inspire you by showing CRISPR-Cas9, which is in a textbook, but the idea that I started this so I could do it, right? Not that I expect all of you to get into CRISPR-Cas9, but some of you might have some ambitions in getting into these things. So think about it. All of my colleagues, actually the majority of them, 
uh, from places like this. So right, so, so that was about editing the DNA itself. Now, um, if you are somehow not really sure that you wanna cut and paste the DNA itself, why? Because anytime you cut and paste the DNA, you are inducing changes to the genome that can be transmitted to the next generation. Now, we don't know whether this is a great idea because anything that gets passed on to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next generation, we don't know what the biological and evolutionary implications to this stuff, which is why these new technologies like base editing and prime editing are coming in to prevent some of these ethical and biological concerns. But anyway, the point is we really don't know full answers to all of this stuff. And therefore, sometimes people try to rely on uh, working to correct the abnormalities at the RNA level. Why? RNA is synthesized to make proteins within the given organism, within a given cell. And that stuff does not get transmitted to the next generation. Just because I have had an RNA treatment, I can't give it to a child if I have one. So that's in some ways is a really uh, sort of a safe way to do this stuff until we understand the implications, right? So, so to do that, we hijacked a system of RNAs that we, for the longest time, thought as thought of as a junk RNA. These are what are described as micro RNAs. There are about twenty thousand of them in every cell in your body, and they have multiple metabolic functions, uh, mainly to really regulate the RNA expression uh, and protein um, synthesis within cells. So we utilize and hijack that system. What I do then is, again, just like I synthesized or engineered a guide strand for the CRISPR-Cas9, I engineer a microRNA precursor with a corrected gene. And I package that somehow into something and I put it in. That thing goes and binds to a cell and releases the, the, the piece of RNA, the microRNA, goes and gets into the, into the nucleus. And instead of integrating into the DNA, it becomes this circular double-stranded thing called the episomal uh, RNA. And that thing gets transcribed um, and becomes uh, a, a, a double-stranded, uh, initially a double-stranded, and then becomes a single-stranded RNA. And the way that I engineer this stuff is that there is enough complementarity to go and read the abnormal piece of an abnormal gene. So, so what I introduced into the cell can then go and bind to an mRNA, messenger RNA coming from an abnormal gene. So that binding leads to a uh, path called RISC, uh, that is um, RNA-induced, uh, uh, I'm blocking out the word, RISC. Um, I'm sorry, I'm blocking out RISC. Um, it is a complex where that double strand, uh, the, the engineered RNA and the abnormal mRNA binding leads to a process where the mRNA gets destroyed and no abnormal mRNA and therefore no abnormal protein and therefore no disease or at least the progression of the disease is stopped. So, uh, so that's a very quick introduction to what is called RNA interference. Basically, I'm interfering with an abnormal RNA from being able to produce abnormal proteins. I can do the opposite also where I can in, insert a normal gene into an RNA and that can lead to the production. That, that binding can then introduce a new gene that is corrected, that was originally missing into a gene that is, or mRNA strand that's missing and that can start producing the correct uh, protein, for example, in thalassemia or, or um, sickle cell disease. So that's RNAI. Uh, so this is the second level of gene therapy. Now, if you're still not really quite sure about fiddling with RNA, you can still do other things. And this is where people who are interested in chemistry can do stuff. This is what is called antisense oligonucleotides. You synthesize a chemical backbone and attach different, uh, all of the different bases uh, that can be complementary. And that can be introduced usually as an intrathecal injection in certain diseases. That stuff then gets into the cells, goes and, for example, if you have an abnormal gene, one mechanism that works with ASO therapy is to go and sit on top, of, top at the top end of the mRNA. And that basically is like putting, like what happened to the Candy Columbo Road? It's kind of like blocked with a big rock. And therefore, it cannot go through the ribosomal machinery, and therefore, no proteins can be made. 
And that is what is called steric hindrance. And the next one is a little bit more complicated, but the same idea where the degradation is caused by attaching these, these complementary strands or, or complementary bits of the backbone that I have modified. Uh, relatively straightforward chemistry, technological um, uh, challenges are there, but this is fairly well understood. So this is what came up in 2016. The two uh, approved treatments were originally ASO. So, so, so that's like the three levels of how to develop therapies for abnormal genes. Now, once these therapies are discovered and developed in a lab, you have to get these things to the people, right? To the humans, how do you do that? So two broad approaches. One is to do what is called ex vivo uh, gene therapy. The other one is in vivo. Ex vivo is, for example, for diseases like thalassemia and, and sickle cell disease, where you harvest uh, progenitor cells from your uh, um, uh, um, bone marrow and you insert the corrected gene by using the same technologies that I mentioned previously. And the insertion of these technologies actually have to rely on, for example, different viral vectors or nanoparticles. Either way, you do this outside of the body. And once corrected, the, uh, the stem cells, uh, the progenitor cells can then be in, introduced back into the, the person, the patient who has the disease. And that is why it is called ex vivo. I don't do this work. I actually work in what is called in vivo where I, uh, well, not just me, but my team and people like us, we, we generate or engineer the gene we package it and we put it directly into the, into the person, into the appropriate space or tissue space. So to do that here, I am going to talk about viruses because it's a timely time. We are in the middle of a viral uh, pandemic, but I work with viruses every day in my work. I work with uh, DNA and RNA. And again, the key idea is like this stuff. We understand this technology when people say, the vaccines were developed within a year, you say, no, bullshit, you don't know what you're talking about. This goes back for the mRNA vaccines, the history is 30 years old. For this work, we are standing on the shoulders of people who did this work 60 years ago, right? So anyway, so you do need something to deliver the stuff that you make in the lab. And we have chosen viral capsules for this work because they are very efficient in doing that. You think of this as, so the engineered piece of whatever the DNA or RNA as your letter, if you remember writing letters, uh, you had to put the letter in an envelope. So this is your envelope. So, so to write the letter, put it in the right envelope, and that protects the encapsulated genome. It actually, because the envelope, you write the address, it goes to the right cell or the right tissue and releases the message that's inside the, inside the envelope. So that is what is called AAV. So AAV, are a type of, or a class of viruses, adeno-associated viruses. They always live in association with the adenoviruses that gives you the, the, the flu uh, during the month of December, the flu season. But this particular virus, it's an associated virus. They are not pathogenic. They have a very simple structure, uh, very small genome, what is uh, shown up here on the right-hand side. Uh, basically, the genome consists of two genes, what is called the replication gene and the capsid gene. So the rep and cap, what I do, people like me, again, I say, I always remember, there's no one person who's doing this. It's always a team, it's a huge team, well, depending on the size of the lab that you're working with, but usually, you know, a few people at least. But the concepts come from thousands of people. But anyway, you, you take out the rep and the cap gene, put in something called a promoter, so you can target a specific cell or a tissue, and you put what is called the transgene. Transgene means the gene that I'm transferring, that I have engineered then you put this stuff back into the, uh, the gene somehow. How do you do that? To do that, you have to figure out like certain different kinds of properties in the viruses that you're gonna use. There are about 12 different serotypes for the AAV and we all carry them. All of the humans are you know, carriers of all of these AAVs, but they are not very good, uh, especially if you were to use them as carriers of these transgenes. So, there are many efforts to optimize these, what are called capsid is the envelope. There are many different ways of engineering them more precisely so they can get to a certain tissue. For example, if you want to treat a brain disease, I don't want the virus to go to the liver because I'm going to lose all of my, my corrected genes, right? So you can, you can precisely modify these things. And there are these different ways of sort of optimizing. And there's an entire field called vector engineering. So some of my colleagues call themselves the vector engineers. 
And like that, there are also uh, ways of optimizing the transgene itself. Um, and those folks call themselves the, the gene editors. Uh, and so again, you know, again, a lot of technology here, but the key is to really remember that lots of efforts are happening about how to achieve precision and also how to package more and more message into a very limited uh, space that you have inside, inside the virus. The viral genome itself is actually pretty small. The entire length of the, the viral genome, the original viral genome is about 4,700 base pairs. So that's not a lot, not much can be packaged in that. So large corrected genes cannot be packed into this particular virus, which is why this is a like thalassemia and sickle cell disease requires um, ex vivo treatment because then we use something called lentiviruses, which has much bigger uh, uh, cargo capacity. It's like using a small truck versus a big truck, or you call them tippers, right? So big tipper versus a small tipper to carry, I don't know, 1,000 pounds of bread versus 8,000 pounds of bread, different truck. So that kind of idea. But again, many efforts are happening in how to engineer this stuff. So, uh, so how do you do this? So people who do the gene editing work, they design, uh, I don't know, a few dozens of different transgene candidates and you, you screen them in what is called in silico, that means on a computer using various uh, software packages to look for their properties and potency and safety, no, using whatever we currently know. Um, because they, they have very many similarities. They're slightly different, one letter here, one letter there, right? Once some of these seem to be pretty decent for the purpose of what you're trying to utilize them, then you can take them into the next level of development. Uh, where you actually do a lot of in vitro on petri dishes. And then the next level, of course, is to use mice and rats. And then finally, you carry these through, a small set of these things are carried through to non-human primates, usually rhesus monkeys, and sometimes cynomorphous. So we do this work, and finally, when NHP or the, the non-human primate work is ready, where potency and safety of that treatment that's packaged in, in the viruses uh, seem to be pretty good and efficacious by way of either reducing an abnormal protein or inducing an, a missing protein, then we are ready for what is called clinical development, which is where I get this stuff handed over to me. I mean, I'm already involved right from the beginning because I need to tell the scientists, this is what I need, this is how it ought to work. So doctors are very important. This is a job because we are the only ones who actually understand what happens to the humans. Um, but anyway, so at the end, it gets to people like me and we carry it through to the humans. So I don't know whether I need to spend a lot of time about the AAV, probably not. So you might wonder, how the hell do you do that? How do you package these engineered genes and uh, uh, viruses together? This is how you do it. You use, again, you know, what we are doing in science is we are not really engineering things from nothing. We use what is already existing in the evolutionary history of life. So plasmids are these naked pieces of double-stranded DNA. They kind of float around in bacterial cells. It's a very simple structure. Usually bacterial plasmids carry the antibiotic resistance, right? So we ever seen protein, uh, penicillin resistance, for example. This is the penicillin resistance uh, plasmid. And they undergo rapid mutations. So you can take this out and you can modify that thing by using different types of endonucleases that are also naturally occurring. There are thousands upon thousands of uh, naturally occurring endonucleases. These are capable of cutting at very precise places by recognizing a certain set of lesser letters. So I can cut the plasmid in a certain place and uh, also use the same type of endonucleases to synthesize whatever the transgene that I'm doing. And uh, so you, you create one plasmid uh, to cut uh, an original uh, or endonuclease to cut an original plasmid. You can use another endonuclease to put in something that is that I am engineering, and and you so you sort of generate three different lines of uh, plasmids. One that contains uh, something to support the build up of the, the envelope the plasmid, the, the capsid itself. Second plasmid carries the gene that I want to introduce to the patient. Third one has multiple helper functions. So you mix these three plasmids in a sort of like a flask and you basically this is cooking. Now here, 
I can easily say, here is where we do the cooking, meaning you maintain certain temperatures, you give certain nutrients, and you let them cook. Cook for about two to three weeks, depending. And then these plasmids recombine. This is where the, the word recombinant technology comes in. And eventual product is a, a group of viruses or a package or, or millions and millions upon the same virus that carry the transfer gene that I engineered. So then you harvest this stuff. You make sure that they have certain properties that you're looking for. So quality control, et cetera, et cetera. And then you make sure that they are pure uh, because every batch, every single time must be pure, must meet all these. I mean, the, we have, for example, administered about 6 billion uh, vaccines up until this point in time through the human, right? Every vaccine has undergone this process of safety and purity and functionality and, and characteristics. And so this is done every time. So again, like the reason why I'm putting this slide is for those of you who are not interested in one thing, might be interested in another thing. So you can have a job in quality control. You can have a job in transfection. You can have, uh, I don't know, cell cultivation because different cell lines are being used to generate these, uh, these uh, transfected uh, genomes, for example. So anyway, um, so this is, this is the process of uh, how to develop the drug itself. Once these things are developed, all this stuff happen to every single batch. You identify what is in quantity, potency, purity, and safety before they are released to the hands of doctors who can eventually administer. The administration can be done by way of different routes. You can obviously do IV, or you can actually, if you want to treat a brain disease, you kind of decide, I want to put it in the brain because I don't care to put this stuff in the liver or in the lungs. So you can directly put stuff in the brain or in the eye, into the spine and so on and so forth. How do you do that? In the case of uh, brain, for example, there are microsurgical techniques where you generate a tiny little hole, what, are, what is called a burr hole, and you put a little cannula like that. This is work we did, uh, uh, one of our, our research studies. So I'm putting a gene therapy into the putamen of a patient with Parkinson's disease. So a tiny little hole, a cannula is attached like a syringe, very long cannula, which is uh, made of a particular kind of a ceramic. And then a line is attached to the end of the syringe that is attached to a precision driven pump. And the drug is now pumped through that, uh, that pump into the brain. And I mix it with gadolinium. And in real time, as the drug is going on, I can see the drug spreading in the right place and not spilling outside. So that's the bright spot that you see. So this is what is called stereotaxy based interparenchymal delivery. What stereotaxy means is the three dimensional space that we have defined uh, to locate the brain. So if I would say minus two, a minus five and uh, 17, I would know exactly what is that place in the brain. Uh, one side is minus the other side based on the midline and the ACPC line. But anyway, these things are fairly fundamental uh, engineering problems to sort of give you, this is like using the GPS for the brain. And we have a very good GPS map for the brain. So that's one way, right? If I want to just stay with the brain. If I don't want to be in the brain or it is difficult to get to a particular location, you can actually get to what is called the cisterna magna. You put a bunch of hardware at the back of your brain and you can put a needle and a cannula into the cisterna magna and introduce your treatment. And that stuff will then get into the CSS space and go up and down along the CSA pathways and then eventually be absorbed into the brain tissue. If you want to stick to the spinal cord itself, you can do the same thing down below using intrathecal injections. The best would perhaps be the IV because of the ease, right? You don't need specialized neurosurgeons. You don't need like uh, multi-million dollar equipment and the training. So that stuff, I actually trained in stereotaxy and the DBS, but it's, it's very rare even in the States. I'm not saying this to brag. It's just, it takes, I mean, think about it, like after my medical degree, I was in training for 14 years. So the average astronaut who goes to the space station has about five years of training. So that's the kind of training that requires. So in the US, it's very difficult for people to say yes to that training because, you know, people want to get paid. I was happy, yeah, sure, I'll train because uh, I kind of want to do more stuff. But, but the point is, it, it, it's cumbersome. It's also difficult to imagine like that kind of treatment will come to countries like here or to India or to Bangladesh or to Mozambique. So we want to develop gene therapies that can be developed by IV. That way I can send you a vial by FedEx. It'll come here next day and you just connect it to an IV line and that gets to the right tissue. This is what we are showing here. 
So your normal serotype of AAV9, when it's given to a mouse prey, and you can see on the left-hand side, not a lot of luminance, but if I engineer the capsid by, so this is the AAV9, PHPB is an enhancement of the capsid. Once that is done, we have, what we have done is what is called the tissue tropism, the binding capability of a particular viral capsid has been enhanced, so it gets to the the tissue that I'm interested in and releases the gene into that tissue and not to the other tissues. So that's what you're seeing on the right hand side, the bright luminance where I have been able to completely transduce the entire brain compared to the original unmodified capsid. So a lot of this work is still like, you know, early days, but this is where we are going. Eventually we want to do treatments that can be delivered by IV or at a minimum where anybody can do a lumbar puncture, any good doctor should be able to do it. Uh, especially a neurologist in the US. So, so that's the idea. Those two would be our preferred routes. So again, so those are the basics of the technology. I'm almost kind of running out of time. How much more time can you give me? So I'll try to give you like the rest of it in 10 minutes. All this is technology that can be done in benches and uh, tables and even monkeys, but you have to take this stuff to the doctors. How do you make all this stuff to become drugs? That becomes very complicated. A drug is where you think about what your goals of medicine being a doctor. So you try to preserve life when possible. You try to restore function if possible. You always try to alleviate suffering and you try to cure disease if possible. That's the kind of work that I'm involved with. My particular goal of medicine is like the fourth one right now. Most of you are probably doing the, the prior three. And so all of us are needed, but you know the last line is where I am at. So do that to taking this kind of technology, the patients have multiple challenges and some of them are biological. One fundamental question, how to get to the right cell, right tissue and get into the cell because cells don't really like stuff coming and trying to get inside, right? If you have packed bus and already on the footboard, you don't want to have other like five people coming and jumping on the bus. If the bus is going to Jaffna, you don't want to have people jumping on board to go to, I don't know, some other place, let's say Gaul or someplace. So those kinds of critical questions, biological challenges are there. The second biological challenge is really is to avoid what is called off-target engagement, meaning if I have developed a transgene to treat a brain disease, I do not want that transgene to go to the liver or the kidney or to the spleen. So again, this is where the, the things I mentioned about capsid engineering and transgene engineering comes very, very complicated. The third thing is, although these viruses are not pathogenic themselves, they are still viruses. And once you put this stuff inside the body, they can induce a minor immunogenic reaction, not a reaction, immunogenic response. So you, this is one and done, we call it. You can't put this stuff back in another time because immunogenicity will occur. But with that initial response of immunogenicity itself, sometimes bad things can happen, white matter lesions in the brain, for example, or liver damage and so on. So, so we are trying to also engineer capsids where immunogenicity is diminished or removed altogether from these engineered capsids. So those are biological challenges. Uh, so to do that, then again, uh, we also have to understand the patient population. And this is one place where you can contribute. Anytime you see a lysosomal storage disease patient, for example, in, P in Neiman Pick uh, disease type one, for example, or Hunter's syndrome or whatever, think about it. We know very little about the natural history of those diseases. You probably read what is in the textbook, but remember those textbook descriptions are written on the basis of one or two patients. Companies like mine and uh, places where this kind of work is done, we will be happy to pay millions of dollars for a properly conducted natural history study. So think about it. If you see a case, look for the next case and the next case and, and talk to people like me or talk to other people, whomever you want to reach out and say, hey, we are interested in developing a natural history study, publish them and maintain your natural history profile. Even if you do not have treatments, maintain natural history profile. What the disease does to a child over time or a person. And that information is very important because I wanna know whether the transgene that I synthesized is capable of changing the natural history of a given disease. Without that knowledge, I cannot get approval. And to do that, we have to go to the doctors and say, hey, we need natural history. In fact, I'm changing jobs when I go back in December. And my first job is to, uh, initiate a natural history study on a certain genetically based uh, epilepsy syndrome. 
and there'll probably be about 25 patients in the entire United States, but I'll find them. And so for three years, somebody will study 25 of those kids to see what happens, during which time I'll do all the other stuff in the lab and monkeys and blah, blah, blah. By the end of those three years, I'll have what happens to the kids, the population of kids, and then I'll be able to use the, those, those changes that happen to convince the FDA to say, yeah, sure, your drug is good enough to undergo human trials, not approval, but human trials. You know, so I am not even going into the ethical conditions, considerations of altering the genome itself, but that's a huge thing, a challenge that we really don't fully understand the repercussions of. The second thing is, again, does it work? If I have a treatment, anytime you treat something with some, some disease with something, any drug, even the stuff that you use, if you give Tylenol to a patient for a fever, you want to ask the question, does it work? If you do ask the question, how do you know that that works? So this is where different types of bioassays come into play. If I want to try to diminish the toxic protein, I have to be able to show that that particular uh, protein get diminished with my treatment. To do that, you have to develop very precise, very uh, sensitive bioassays that can be repeatedly used in every patient every single time. So, so that's number one. Number two, you also want to answer the question, are these outcomes clinically meaningful? Is the reduction of a certain toxic protein really translate into an alteration or a change in the natural history? So many of these rare diseases, because they are rare, have very limited information in the natural history. So these are challenges that we are going through. And these are the questions that I am asked. And this is my life's work right now, trying to answer some of these questions. Biomarkers are, again, partly what I already mentioned about these different proteins, but there are other biomarkers, right? Things like uh, MRI, things like PET imaging. So you want to develop very precise uh, biomarkers that is valid for a given patient population for a known disease pathology. Just taking someone in the scan and getting pictures of the brain is asinine. It doesn't give you any useful information. So you want to find technology that has clinical meaningfulness. In Parkinson's disease, for example, I want to know what it does to the dopamine levels or the dopamine receptors in the brain if my treatment is actually working. And then I want to know whether that change in the brain that I just observed with the PET imaging translates into an actual clinical benefit that withstands time's uh, progression. So, you know, this is what, it, what is meant by in vivo biomarkers. And I think the third thing I'm going to talk to you about is, is about the biomarkers because everyone has a cell phone these days, people think you know getting digital data is easy or a Fitbit or whatever. But you wanna think, are you trying to get information that is already, we are able to get it by paper and pencil. So are you trying to just introduce newer and fancier technology just to make money off of people? So that's pointless, we are not interested in that. We want digital biomarkers that can, for example, add value to the work you're doing shorten the clinical trial length or, or decrease sample size because clinical trial size, so I was telling uh, uh, some of uh, the folks who are here, a 10 patient clinical trial for gene therapy, the kind that I'm doing, I can burn $30 million in two years without even realizing it's, it's really expensive, this stuff. So, so you, therefore you wanna make sure that the biomarkers that you use, and these words that I'm dropping here, things like digital biomark biomarkers, Think about them because in the future, when you see a Parkinson's patient, you might tell a patient, hey, use this app and show me what happens when you're at home because you can use that stuff. But again, if you can do that with a piece of paper and a pencil, that's not a great biomark. So this is where I'm leaving you the opportunity to think about like newer and clever ways of developing digital biomarkers. With that, uh, I think I'm coming to the end. So. I, I, I gave you a ton of information. I'm pretty sure it all went over your heads, but I'm hoping that once you go home and go to sleep tonight, some of this will stick in your minds. And so you might want to think, oh my God, this is not relevant. We can't do this stuff. Or you can sit and think, what can I do? So the first thing I would say to the young people, especially, and also the older and senior people also, be inquisitive. Always remember there's no such thing as useless knowledge. Everything you know has utility. And this is not something I said. This is the founder of the Institute of Advanced Studies. He said this, and that place is where Einstein spent his last 35 years. So the fundamental tenant of that place is there's no such thing as useless knowledge. Think about it. When he introduced relativity theory in 1903 and 1905 later on, 
nobody thought that that use. But nowadays, without that, you don't have a cell phone and your GPS, right? So same thing, what you know will have some utility someday. So try to be very inquisitive. When you learn something, usually I know a lot of things is learned by road, but not only what you know, but how do you know it? Meaning if you have an olive in your palm, how do you know the nature of that olive so that you fully understand that thing, whether it's a gene, whether it's an olive, whether it's your cell phone, try to understand everything, whatever that thing that drives your fancy and learn what you can. If you don't have all of this technology, at least learn the theory. All this stuff is in your books. Uh, all the resources are now available on, on your handphone and your, on, your, on your computers. Those of you who don't know how to find these uh, resources, you can email me. I'll share my email shortly. So learn what you can, because once you move on from you know, here to another place, that knowledge will become useful and then let your mind wander and, and let, let your mind imagine things and let, the, let your mind dream. And I want to close out with two different quotes. This one is the last passage or the last paragraph of the last book written by Stephen Hawking. I'm going to let you read it. And this, if you remember the rover landing on Mars, the, the, the parachute with the orange and white colors, this was the message that was embedded on that parachute. People didn't realize, but some did. So we, you know, many people got interested in decrypting that message. And this was the message. They are mighty things. It was originally said by Teddy Roosevelt, one of the US presidents back in the day. Now it's the logo of the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. There are mighty things. When you think something is important, do that thing because it is impossible. So that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for being here. And this is my email. You can write to me and I'll write back. Thank you for this opportunity. And I don't know whether we have questions. You can have a question. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And start. Print. I think thank you for this uh, highly exciting uh, area, introducing us and making us aware so that I think I may, we may understand 10%, 20%, each, whatever, but at least you make us inquisitive so that we will start reading about it and all. I just want to ask you about, uh, are there anything available for ALS now on uh, RNA? Well, so no, there's nothing good, but multiple companies are going through uh, different treatment trials. In fact, I am working on a trial myself People started with what is called a source, uh, the antisense oligonucleotides. That didn't really pan out. So then we were working on something called uh, um, RNA interference. Because when you think about ALS, uh, that is Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, motor neuron disease, only about 10% of that disease has direct gene abnormalities, like the SOD1 and the, uh, the, the open reading frame on the chromosome 9, what is called the C9 or Rx72. So we are working on fixing those genes, but the problem is the vast majority of the patients who have ALS, we don't know the full story of the genetic, kind of like hypertension. We know that genetics influence hypertension, but we don't know the full picture. So only a handful of patients of the general um, ALS community will eventually have treatment, probably within the next five to 10 years would be my guess, because somebody's gonna crack this one. It wouldn't be my company, it could be some other company, it could be my company, we don't know. But Tons of people are working on that stuff as proof of concept. Sure. Well, so, so the question is when in the cell cycle, if there's an abnormality in the DNA occurs, it's expected for the cell cycle to not let that abnormality proceed. But that would be the ideal, but that usually doesn't happen, which is why you have all the cancers, right? Cancers are where cells are replicating with abnormalities in their gene sets. So ideal situation would be not for the abnormality to proceed, but they do. And there's no good way for us to know how to stop that at this point. Uh, those are the sorts like the inspirations for the future. Can you stop that? So cancer gene therapy is an entirely separate area that I didn't even touch upon. That field is huge. 
um, people are doing already like crazy things, all these, if you ever read about, for example, the chimeric T cells, so the CAR T therapy, et cetera, et cetera. These are like these engineered T cells with uh, different modified genes that can be delivered into the cancer directly, especially for hemopoietic cell cancers. So that stuff's already actually happening. Uh, I think there's a chat question, let me see. Uh, thank you for this message. Uh, I haven't seen your pitch, yeah, thank you. Those who are joined uh, via Zoom also can uh, ask any questions from here if uh, time permits. But yeah, no, I, I can spend another. I, I have to go uh, probably in like 10 minutes or so, but that's okay. Uh, and, and also like any questions, if you don't think of anything, definitely email me. This is why I'm leaving the email address here. Yeah. So the ideal would be to actually do it on an individual basis. So we are not there yet. That full, full blown precision medicine where somebody sequences my gene, gene, uh, my genome, and and creates a G, uh, engineered gene that that only works for me. That's probably at least a generation or two out. Right now, we are genetically modifying genes or the RNA to treat, say, a group of patients. For example, in Huntington disease. It's the one trans gene that we try to uh, deliver right now. That's where the technology. But eventually, yeah, I want I want to have like something very precise for me, and you want to have something that matches your genome and not anybody else's genome. And and we'll get there because sequencing used to be a couple million dollars, but now I can sequence a human genome by thousand dollars over a couple of days. So technology is pretty cheap, and and probably within the next five six years it'll become five hundred dollars. So it will be expensive, but not so much. So, so these are huge questions. I, I didn't really get there, but I, I will, we do expect some um, differences, right? Humans are different, but also not so much. I mean, between us and the chimps, that's our closest evolutionary cousin. The differences are very minuscule, less than a percentage point in the totality of the DNA. So it's like 1% of the DNA that we share between us and the monkeys that we, all these differences that you see caused by that one percent even within that one percent we do expect certain ethnic differences but only so much you can still probably engineer a trans gene that can treat humanity in general precision comes the requirement for precision comes for other reasons that i de really didn't touch upon i'll drop a word see whether you'll remember this there's something called somatic instability for example where the mutation type the expansion rate for a certain gene, for example, can change from cell to cell or tissue to tissue, even within the brain, for example. So that stuff is where the precision is necessary, but we are not really sure whether that's, that's even essential. We don't know that, that stuff yet. That will be probably not even your generation, but maybe like your children's generations, you know, scientists will figure that out, I think, 30 years out, 40 years out maybe. Sure. It's all, all this is for the time being is what is called one and done, mainly because of the, the, the carrier, right? The viruses will induce an immune response. So the next time I put in the same thing, if I try, I will kill the patient. So it's, it's one time right now. Until we figure out to completely kill or eliminate the immunogenic properties of the virus itself and the transgene itself. Actually, this is fascinating because up until fairly recently, a few months ago, we didn't realize that certain letter sequences in the transgene itself can be immunogenic within the cell itself. That stuff just like happened. Like we just, we were like, oh my God, how do you deal with that one? So, so, you know, again, this is one and done. And that might not be a bad thing because we are really altering the gene or the gene product itself. You really want to keep it to one and done because these are expensive technologies. Even 50 years from now, they will still be expensive. So we don't expect repeated administrations, no. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I think I think a good tissue to think about would be the liver. Uh, we don't we don't think that the entire liver gets rebuilt over a person's lifetime. Some cells will remain of the billions and billions of born liver cells. Not all of them gets lost or die. So the expectation and and again, like we deliver usually about several million copies of these viruses in a given treatment. So the expectation is enough of them will remain in situ for the life of the patient to produce the, the treatment effect. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And that's where the ex vivo treatments are happening for blood diseases, for example. That's, that would be the best thing. But again, you know, getting to places like liver and, and, uh, and the brain, I mean, the liver is much easier, I would say. Uh, the brain is almost impossible at this point in time, which is also why I'm fascinated by it. But the point is, yes, this would be the ideas. And this is where, you know, anyone, people who are at least theoreticians, even, even if you don't have any of this stuff, if you can think through how to do this and model things on your computer, for example, bioinformatics is the, the technology that people use for that kind of question. So you can work on this stuff. And these are pertinent questions. We don't know the answers. I have a question here. Can the normal gene be used to make the recombinant DNA with the viral vector rather than editing the abnormal gene? So I don't know what that means because if you have a normal gene, there's no need to come uh, to to everyone. So um, yes, uh, Dr. Priyanta, what I meant was a normal gene from another person. Well, so so you don't need to take a normal gene from another person. We we know what the normal gene is. Say, for example, in the Huntington disease case, for example, we know that CAG repeats ought to be less than 36. You don't need to really take it from another person. I can just... Yeah, you know, normal, easy. No, yeah. normal gene right. uh, produced by PCRO uh, by some means. Uh, can't we uh, recombine that gene with the vector? That's what we the, do, actually. Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. that's what we do. Yeah. Basically, we're trying to introduce the normal gene. You just have to use the... the the viral vector as a carrier of, of that yeah. engineered piece. Yeah, thank you. The cells don't recognize sequences. Uh, the letters strings go and read the other letters in the DNA. I probably don't understand the question. Maybe you can email me your question and I'll try to figure out the answer. Yeah? Right. I think um, it's time. I think we had to uh, let uh, Priyanta leave because you have to go back to uh, Colombo as well. So uh, I think uh, even uh, for a very naive person like me to this subject. I think I got a um, significant amount of um, idea what it is all about. We have all heard about gene therapy and you know, all this stuff. But getting that from uh, a person who really does it is, I think it's um, really a um, good experience for all of us. And uh, um, I think on behalf of uh, the faculty um, and the PIMSA, I would like to uh, say a big thank you to uh, Dr. Priyanta Ferrat for uh, getting his uh, free time on us to um, educate on uh, some other important aspects in uh, gene therapy. And uh, I'm sure there are so many of uh, us who would like to uh, communicate with him. And uh, he's a person who, I knowing him, will help uh, all of you so if you can. And uh, with that, we'll uh, uh, close this um, session. And on behalf of uh, PEMSA, let me uh, um, award a small token of appreciation. Um, can I invite uh, Professor Vajir Veera Singh to uh, hand over that to Priyanta? What are you giving me? Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Okay. See the board there. Oh, oh there. Oh, my God. Your, your oh, name and you see over there. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. All right, so thank you guys. Thanks for being here. I'm going to get out because uh, I'm a little worried about the traffic. So if you have my email, any of you, every one of you can write. And uh, I usually write back. So you can even write me snail mail if you like, because I still do. So no, I actually do. I still have my account here. All right, so thank right, you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So please stay in touch. I, I would also stay in touch. This is so good. We should try to hang out.